This is the School Success Podcast, a podcast for school leaders to learn from other school leaders what's working and what's not, and to get inspiration and encouragement, as well as strategies to grow school enrollment, connect with families, retain teachers, recruit teachers, and everything in between. You guys are heroes, and I cannot thank you enough for pouring into this next generation that's coming behind us. My goal is you will take at least one thing away from every episode that you can take back to your school to make it better than it is right now. Please enjoy the School Success Podcast. Hey, School Success Makers. Today, we're joined by my new friend, Nathan Long, out of the great state of Pennsylvania. His Christian school is right in the heart of Amish country, and they're doing some amazing things there. And I love, love, love this conversation with him today, and I'm sure you guys will too. So please enjoy this next episode of the School Success Podcast. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the School Success Podcast. I'm your host, Mitchell Slater, joined by a new friend out of Pennsylvania, Nate Long, who is the head of school at Lancaster County Christian School in none other than Lancaster, Pennsylvania, guys. So uh, summer is upon us as we're recording this, so I know they're having some some heat up there, just like I'm having heat here in Florida, as always. But I am excited to dive into his Christian school and what they're doing up there I don't want to take any thunder away from him, so I will pass it off to him to introduce himself. So, Nate, welcome to the podcast, sir. Thanks, Mitchell. Thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here, excited about our conversation. Me too, man. And I've never been to Pennsylvania, so I always love asking people about where they're from. So what's fun to do there in Lancaster? What's something I would want to do if I went and visited? Yeah, there's there's all kinds of stuff to do here in Lancaster. We are known for the Amish, if you've heard of the Amish, which is a religious sect, a really plain conservative sect of Anabaptists. So we're known for them. So it's kind of, we live in a pretty rural area, but we also have a really cool little city uh, that's that's really developed over the last 10 to 15 years. Some really great restaurants. We have a town about 15 minutes away in Lancaster County called Lidditz, and that was voted like best small town in America within the last like five or six years, I think. So it's great. We are within three and a half hours of New York, Baltimore, Washington, DC, Philadelphia, and about four hours away from Pittsburgh. So we're within driving distance of about 50% of the population in the United States. So, (laughs) you know, if if we ever want to go do something in a big city, it's pretty easy. Good. Well, it sounds like I mispronounced it wrong. So what what did I I say it wrong? It sounds like, how do do you pronounce it? Uh, Lancaster. Oh my gosh. I never would have thought that. Okay. Lancaster. Yeah. the, The California version is Lancaster. That's what we found out. Okay. Apologies. I was like, oh shoot, I butchered it. (laughs) No, it's great. Well, being where you guys are in Pennsylvania, you're close to all those different places. What's the sports team that everybody goes for? Since you're kind of right there in the middle, like who, what, is there one that people lean towards for NFL or NBA or anything? Yeah. So we, we are definitely a Philadelphia County. The Susquehanna River divides Lancaster County from York County. And once you go over the river, you pretty much become a Baltimore fan, which is unique, either Pittsburgh or Baltimore, but we're definitely in, in Philadelphia territory right here. So. Okay. All right. Fight Eagles fight. All right. That's right. And I, one of the things I love about the Northeast, and again, I've only really been to like the DC area, I haven't even been to New York city before, but I love that you guys are big with like farming as well as like just produce and I think apples, right. Are really big there in Pennsylvania to grow. What's the, What are some of yeah. the other produce? Yeah. There? Adams County is huge for apples, Adams and Franklin County mushrooms, believe it or not, as you go a little bit closer to Philadelphia, right out in Chester County, mushrooms is really big around us. It's pretty much everything. My parents owned a family business and we had a stand at local central market which is the oldest continuous running market in the country. So it's pretty cool. My first job was at a produce stand, but it's my dad owned a horseradish business. So it's a pretty unique business. So he just made horseradish. Yeah. Oh man. Good for him. I don't like horseradish, but Hey, yeah. you know, to each their own. Yeah. Uh, I wish we grew apples here in Florida. It's too hot, but we get the citrus. So I have a right. they're tiny at the moment, but I have a lemon and an orange tree in the backyard with a couple baby, you know, baby lemons in it. But an apple tree is just, I don't know. I love looking at the orchards and the pictures. It's just very comforting and like cozy looking when I see like the Northeast. So your area is very beautiful. I will tell you that. Yeah. Thank you. So tell me about this school that you're at, how long you've been there, maybe a little bit of history of the school before we kind of dive into some questions with it. Yeah. So Lancaster County Christian School has been in existence for 12 years now. 
It is the result of a merger between two schools, Living Word Academy and Lancaster Christian School. So in 2010, they decided to merge together and form one school. The vision behind it was to be really a countywide Christian school, an option for all of our families in this county. It's a pretty conservative area in Lancaster. And so that was the vision and heart behind it. So since the merger, it's been about 12 years. I have worked in one of those three schools for 16. So I started coaching when I was 20 years old. I started coaching soccer and basketball at Living Word Academy. And then I actually transitioned over to Lancaster Christian the year before the merger and was their varsity basketball coach and then transitioned back to LCCS as we merged together to form Lancaster County Christian School in 2010. Okay. And no connection to a specific church is like the sponsoring church. It's kind of independent. Right. Yeah. So we are independent. Living Word Academy was a church run school by a large church in Lancaster County called the Worship Center. We actually, our current building is the Living Word Academy campus. We moved from two campuses to one campus about four and a half years ago, but in through the merge, the Worship Center gave up authority of running the school and we became a board run school. Very good. Obviously, it sounds like things are running smoothly. They're, they're going yeah. good. So yeah, that's it's exciting. Been, it's been great. Yeah. Good. Well, I always start off, I want to know some challenges. So I'd love to hear some challenges you guys specifically as a school are kind of up against, but also how are you combating those challenges you guys have? Sure. I would say currently, I mean, there have been a number of challenges throughout the past two and a half years that all schools have faced and had to overcome, whether it's, you know, decisions regarding how we're going to handle COVID and what's school going to look like? How did we adapt? How were we flexible and nimble to pivot when the pandemic started in 2020? And I would say currently now, one of the challenges we're facing is over the past 12 months, we've been growing pretty rapidly. So we've grown by 42% from last year to this current school year, and we're looking at more growth for next year. So I think one of our big challenges has been, how do we maintain culture and the culture that we've created at our school of 300 students as we grow and we're approaching 500 possibly for next year. So just that really rapid growth and, you know, you're bringing in not only new students and new families to your culture, but you're also bringing in new staff because as you grow, you need to hire more staff and you want to retain your staff so that your culture can be strong and, you know, what, who we are and what we do is known among our stakeholders. So that's really been a challenge that we've faced over the past 12 months, I'd say. Man, and do you have a cap that you guys have as your building size? Or you're like, hey, we can't take any more than 500 this fall. We're at capacity. If the seats were full, it's, uh, I hate that term, right? <laughs> but our classroom caps, if, if we hit all of our classroom caps, our max number next year is 585, which would be a pretty big leap for us. Uh, you know, in the heyday of Living Word Academy and LCS, those schools were both around 500. So getting back to that number would be great. I mean, it would show a lot of health in our area. Our area is kind of unique in the sense that within about a 30 minute drive, there are probably 15 to 16 Christian school options. So whereas in, in Texas or even Florida, maybe you're getting that, that regional Christian school and they're huge, right? Mm -hmm. Over a thousand students. We have a lot of smaller schools and we're one of the larger schools in our area, Christian schools in our area. So. Cap-wise, that, that would be where we're at, 585, but I don't think as a leadership team, we would look forward to growing that quickly, that fast. <laughs> yeah, like you said, hiring right now, and I know with one of the challenges people keep mentioning is the teacher retention, teacher recruitment yep. that's coming up. So I know that would play a, a big role in this. And I guess one of the other questions just for the listeners to know, are you guys a K-12 school as well? So you have like a full spectrum. Yeah, we're, we're a pre-K three to 12 school. So we have a, a three-year-old program all the way up through 12th grade. So it is a really broad spectrum. It's actually something we love about our school that we have students from three years old to 18 years old in the building. They interact with each other. So it's great seeing our senior class come down and help out with our elementary athletic clubs or, you know, any of our other lower school activities that, that we have going on here. A lot of times we'll get our high school students to come down and volunteer and help lead those clubs and those camps for us. So that's always exciting to see that interaction, that mentorship and discipleship that can happen during those times. So it is a unique feature that we love about our building. I do love that. And I actually heard, triggered the reminder for me, I, another person I was interviewing mentioned that 
they hadn't thought of it until they're like, oh my gosh, why don't we do this? Was hire within these kids that are graduating being like, hey, you interested in being a teacher and like just staying around and helping out as the school grows. And I know they were yeah. trying to do that. Is that an option for you guys as well? It's not really just through our accreditation process. We do have a standard that our teachers have a bachelor's degree. So, but we do encourage alumni to come back. We actually hired last year, we hired our first LCCS alumni to come back and be a teacher for us, which was really exciting. We have a number from Living Word Academy and Lancaster Christian School who are teaching for us now, but it was our first since the merger. So it was pretty cool to see them come back and she's doing a great job in our art department in that and helping us move that forward. Man, full circle. I like it. Yeah. And I'm sure there's got to be at least one story of somebody who went there and now their kids go there, right? There's got to be a few of those stories. Oh yeah. We have a lot of alumni and that really is one of the ways we gauge success and how we're doing as a school and, and are we maintaining culture? Are our alumni coming back and sending their students to our school? And it really tells us a really cool story about how much they valued their education here, how much they valued the relationships that they develop with their classmates, with their teachers and just the life lessons they learned. And, uh, you know, hopefully it meant that we taught them well about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, because that's our mission. So we have a number of our staff members actually, who are alumni or alumnus and their kids are here. So I would say alumni students, we probably have a good 40 students who are alumni students, which is pretty cool. So now here's the cool thing. Have you coached anybody that now mm -hmm. you're coaching their kids? Like that's had to be <laughs> close at least by now, 16 years, right? You said? Yeah. So trying to think we have one student who I coached who his children are now in like fourth grade. So I think that's the closest I'm at so far. <laughs> so if you count like summer camps, sure. I've coached a couple of my players, my players, students. Yeah. You're probably like Mitchell, calm yourself. Okay. I'm not that old yet. Like just <laughs> give it some time. Give it some. I'm, I'm only 36. So I got some time. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's cool. Any other challenges you want to, you want to mention before I ask you some additional questions? I know I think, you know, teacher retention is a big one. We've been blessed over the past couple of years to most of our growth and most of our departures of teachers have been what we call, you know, good. I don't know how you, I don't know how you'd phrase that, but it's good, right? We have teachers that are having children and they're choosing to go home and, and be a stay at home mom. And you know, we celebrate that and we're excited about that, that they're having their children and growing their families. We understand what it means for us that we're going to have to fill those roles at times, but that's been great. So that's good attrition, right? And then other positions that we're hiring three new staff members in our middle and upper school this year, just creating new positions with our growth. So those are great holes to have to fill. It doesn't make them any less challenging to fill, but what we're seeing is, you know, we are having some of the public school teachers that want to test out Christian school and what that looks like as an educator. So uh, that's been an interesting shift in mindset that we've seen over the past two or three years where we're getting some of those applicants. And usually, you know, as a small Christian school, we're hiring young teachers right out of college. And this year we're getting more seasoned teachers in our applicant pool, which has been encouraging, but we also love working with young teachers as well and being able to help push them forward in their careers and help them grow as educators. Yeah. And there's always, I feel like two sides to look at that. And there's good arguments on both sides. You go seasoned teacher, maybe in their fifties, been doing this 30 years. They're great, but maybe they're stuck in their ways and they're not going to adapt right. to our ways or the new person who's like, Hey, we can mold them to be exactly the perfect fit for our culture. It's like, oh, which one's the best one? I think there's, you need both. I kind of feel like you almost need both in the. I definitely think you do. And I think the approach we've taken to that is like, we want both, but we want you to continue to grow. Mm -hmm. So what. Some, some of the policies we've put in place over the past two years, just to encourage professional growth in our teachers, we brought back tuition reimbursement. So we have a tuition reimbursement plan for partial reimbursement for, if you want to further your education, you know, we've provided and brought in house some really good professional development opportunities over the past year. And we have a great professional development coordinator who's bringing those in and seeing the needs of our school and the needs of our teachers and, and really trying to push us into the 21st century and what students need. Because even getting into education as a teacher 12 years ago, the needs of our students have drastically changed mm. for me from that perspective. So we always need to be growing in our, in our craft and who we are. And so we encourage our teachers to continue to do that and try and give them opportunities to grow.
Good. One quick question before we jump into the next part I had. You guys as a school, because I know every Christian school is different, especially with the ones I've interviewed. Do you guys require teachers as well as students to be Christians and sign like a declaration of faith to work there or to go there? Or you guys do, don't do that? So all of our, our faculty and staff have to sign our statement of faith. Our students do not necessarily. We are a mission fit school. We're a partner school. So one of the parents of the students must be a follower of Jesus Christ and, and sign that statement of faith. But not all of our students are Christians. You know, we're very transparent about that in new family interviews. We like to say, you know, we don't protect your students from the world. We prepare them to live a Christian life within the world. So we're not a bubble. You know, I don't think we're called to ever cultivate a bubble. You know, God created this world to be beautiful. He created diversity within this world and you know, sin entered it, but we're supposed to be his representatives on this earth and use the talents and abilities we have to glorify him. Good. That's so good. Well, jumping to the next part, which my favorite part to talk about is getting a chance to brag about your school. So you've been there a while. You've seen, you know, things come full circle maybe, but what's something that your guys are doing really, really good at that you'd like to, to, to brag about? So hopefully those that listen are like, oh, <laughs> I want to do that. I want to try and do yeah. what they're doing. And I think one of the things that we do really well here at LCCS is we try and provide our students an opportunity to find out the unique ways that God has kind of wired them, the unique giftings that they have and how he's crafted them so that they can then take those gifts and those abilities and they can use them not only while they're here, but they can foster them and grow them and then take them away from the school and use them to, you know, further the kingdom as they leave here. So about six years ago, seven years ago, we started a program and this is really close to my heart because it was a job that I was asked to do six years ago was to develop an entrepreneurship program here at the school. So we cultivated that program. We partnered. I had a great small group of local business leaders that were parents and just from our community. And then we partnered with a couple Christian colleges that are pretty close by and their business departments. And we kind of sat there and we said, what kind of employees do you want to hire? And then we crafted kind of our program to cultivate those types of individuals. So we really approach it from a mindset perspective. We really think that, or I thought that as I developed the program that, you know, you can learn how to be an entrepreneur. So you can learn how to solve problems. You can learn how to think critically. And these are the skills we want to give you as you go from here. And so we launched our entrepreneurship Academy six years ago. And that's morphed and, and grown and blossomed. And I led that. And about three years into that, I became the director of innovation here. And we launched three more academies, which we now call these four our innovation academies. So we have STEM, the fine arts, entrepreneurship, and then our fourth is leadership and service. And the heart behind that was really, we think when you go into a vocation, your, your vocation falls into one of these four categories. And we want to give our students opportunities while they're in lower school, all the way up through upper school, that they have the opportunity to explore these passions that they have within these academies and kind of give them a shot. Because we were sending students off to college and they'd come back to visit and a year or two in, they'd change their majors. Mm -hmm. And so it, it adds money and it adds time to what they're trying to accomplish in life. And we thought, well, if we would have let you explore those, you wouldn't have made that decision. So. It's grown and it's blossomed and we've failed quite a bit in developing these. And we think we're at a point now where we have a pretty cool working model of what they look like. And so in our lower school, the students have specials. They have STEM specials, entrepreneurship specials, music, all of those kind of encompassed. We kind of teach the leadership and service throughout the three academies as we approach them. Then in middle school, once a month, we don't do traditional school. So the second Wednesday of every month, our students are working in one of those four academies and the academy coordinator for our middle school program kind of just works through each quarter you hit one of those academies so you might quarter one you're doing a project in entrepreneurship and you're learning what that looks like so we may have them start a business and see what that looks like and how are they impacting the world through this business what problems are they solving through this business and then when you get to ninth through 12th grade same concept one day a week or sorry one day a month where we don't do traditional school, we call them academy focus days. In high school, they're getting to pick the project they work on. So our coordinators are developing these projects and we've done crazy stuff. One year, 
I bought a bus and I'm like, we're going to convert this into a tiny house. So we ripped it apart. The students designed and built the tiny house. So the key is that the coordinators, the adults, the teachers kind of come up with the overall concept of the project. And then everything is student driven from there. So they're really the ones that are making the decisions and they're the ones that, you know, when we fail in that project, it's a pretty safe place to fail. Their only grade during that day is a reflection grade. So let's think about the processes that we went through today and, you know, what did we learn? If you failed, how, how would you do it differently? You know, and it's been a great process for us. They have options in all the academies so they can pick what they're passionate about. They sign up for a four month segment and then they can switch. So we really encourage them kind of trying out everything. We've coded video games. We've built drones and flown them around. We built trebuchets. We started a coffee shop. We've done all kinds of stuff. It's been a really cool experience to see it grow and to see the mindset of our students because year one was tough and they did not want to do it. They just wanted us to give them answers and for them to take a test. And we said, no, like this is not like that at all. You come and you explore and you're really just going to be graded on your critical thinking process throughout the day and how well you did and did you participate. So we're about year six into it and they love it. Like they look forward to those days. They actually are senior class. We've been doing exit interviews and a number of them that I've interviewed have said, we want to, you should do more of those days throughout the year. So, you know, we've been contemplating, how do we grow this? Do we add a second day that they do this? And then on top of that, all of our electives in our upper school and middle school flow into one of our academies. So we have a number of entrepreneurship classes, a number of STEM opportunities for them to select fine arts. So just to give them those opportunities to go out and see how has God crafted me and, and knit me together and what gifts has he given me and how can I now use those for his glory to impact people and solve problems. Man, those are sweet programs. And I love that it's hands-on because the that's at least how I learn. I know everybody learns differently, but I'm like, yeah. you're talking about, it. I'm like, I would have thrived in that yeah. hands-on environment. Like, let's build a tiny house. Like, okay, let's do it. Instead of just sit down, let me teach you or tell you something. Let's actually go out and do it. And it's something and I'm sure you guys are obviously doing this. Like, here's how you can use this in a couple of years when you're, you know, officially an adult and, and that stuff just clicks. I feel like so much better. So I'm, I love that you guys are doing that. And have built those four. Is there an idea to add a fifth or do you think four is like literally covers all the bases? Yeah, no, we feel pretty good about the four. I'm sure others would argue that. And I think that's where you need to do what fits your community and your demographic. And, and for us, one of the reasons we chose entrepreneurship first is because our, a lot of our school families are business owners and we had students that, you know, 50% of our students, if they went to college, were majoring in business. So that's why we started with that program. But I think each school just needs to analyze and i would encourage them to do this analyze what do your stakeholders want what does your culture say that that you need and that's what you should do because if, if i was near washington dc we wouldn't do as many we do a lot of trade-based stuff those days so we have a small engines unit we have a group going to an auto mechanic shop right now if i was in a very like affluent urban area i probably wouldn't pick some of those projects for students to work on not that they wouldn't enjoy them or like them but i think you also have to make decisions for your stakeholders and and who are you serving and what are they drawn to we really feel like those four we could get that specific and that narrow like we've talked about do we do a pre-med option like students that are interested in med well mm -hmm. we say that's great but it fits in stem so if we want to teach okay. a sports medicine class we would just it would just fall into that stem category so we really feel comfortable about the four we have right now and just continuing to develop because I'm of the mindset that everything can get better and we're always looking to grow and, and do things differently. So uh, as we continue to tweak those and build on those, I think they're just going to grow and develop and, and become, they'll probably look completely different 10 years from now than they do now. So. And it's a great draw for your school too. I'm sure that that's happened probably already where somebody's like, I got to go to the school because I want to take the STEM program or be a part of this program that they have. Is, have you had stories of that where people came to you just because of these four programs? We've had some families that have shown up and said, well, our friend competed in your Shark Tank event mm -hmm. and we came to watch and it was just really exciting to hear about what you guys do. And the same with some of our other programs as well, whether it's our Fine Arts Showcase or our, our STEM Showcase. And it's been a cool talking point. You know, it's really easy to start a conversation about education when you have 
a cool model like that to talk about that is unique for us in our area. So, yeah, no, for sure. It's way better than saying we make all our kids sit down for six <laughs> hours straight and we just drill them with information from a book. You know, that sounds yeah. way better. Yep. I was going to ask you one more question about that. Oh, for these the things about the one day a month or whatever, if you were to go to two days, how do you guys decide on those? Does that come back to you as the head of school to make that final decision? And it's all you, or is it a board vote, teacher vote? How does that kind of work? Yeah. So operationally, I'd be able to make that decision. Really, we are a governance run policy governance board. So any day-to-day -day operational decisions like that, I can make, I would, I would do that with my leadership team. It's not something I would fly into solo. You know, we'd really evaluate it with both my upper and lower school principal and then all the other members of our leadership team. Like, does this make sense for us? Right now, we take about 5% of our classroom time to do those days. So there is the thought that adding that second day a month would bump us up to 10%. But the amount of learning that takes place on those days is just tremendous. And, you know, part of our job as educators is to make school enjoyable for our students. You know, we want school to be fun. We want school to be a place where they can come and, and just have a blast. And, and quite honestly, we want them to come and to do something that's unexpected at times. So we even have an in initiative that started a year ago with our upper and lower school principals, and they have the ability to do what we call an unexpected joy. And so they wanna take students on a hike we drive up a bus and we call the 10th grade class out of class and we take them on the bus. Like they have no clue they're going. We just take them out and we go. And part of that is we don't want our students to feel like school is predictable, right? We want them to be on their toes and think like, man, is something fun and exciting going to happen today? This Friday, we're doing field day. Like no one does field day for high school kids, but we do it. And hmm. we do a lot of really fun activities. It's all team-based so that they have a blast. And then we'll do an American Gladiators segment at the end, you know, so we're up there launching tennis balls at kids and they're having a blast. And, you know, we want them to come to school and have fun and know that the teachers and the administrators in the building want to have fun along with them. So. I love it. Well, I'm going to second what the kids said to you about having a two. I think you should add two a month. Yeah. Mitchell said there should be two now. So there we go. Well, we'll put it on the admin retreat docket. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Well, as we kind of wrap it up, I always kind of like to end with the same question for everybody and just giving you an opportunity to share if there's one piece of advice you'd want to share with any school leaders listening, what would that piece be? Yeah, I feel uh, kind of out of place doing this as my, I only in my second year as head of school here, but I would say that one of the things that we try and do, and we're not always successful in this, but as a school leadership team, your mission is vital to you being successful. So any decision that, that we make as a team, major, some of them minor, but all of the major decisions that we make, we always evaluate them through the lens of our mission statement. So the meat of our mission statement is really, we are a community of faith and learning dedicated to cultivating disciples of Jesus Christ. So we take kind of those three main things, like the two things are community and discipleship. Like those are our two main keys in our mission statement and then we think is this decision building community and is it giving us an opportunity to disciple students mm -hmm. and if it doesn't we don't do it so they, there have been some great ideas on the table and my team gets a little frustrated with me at times because i'm a big idea person so i'll throw something out there and you know we sit there and we kind of chew on it a little bit and it'll get to the point where we sit there and we say, does it build community and does it make disciples? Does it mm -hmm. give us a chance to disciple? And sometimes the answer is no, or sometimes we do one, but not the other. And we have to evaluate if it's a no, it's off the table. If it, if it builds community, but not in a way that we're discipling, we have to evaluate, is that worth our time and our investment and our money? And if it makes disciples, that's almost always a yes right? Like if we can disciple, it's almost always a yes. So that's, I'd say to any leader out there, mission is key and you have to be really careful. One of the things that we're trying to be really reticent about right now is with our growth, are we drifting from our mission? Do we have this slow drift? Because you don't wake up from one to the other and say, I follow mission. And the next day 
oh, where'd our mission go? Like no one here does it. That's not how it works. It's just a slow fade over time where you, you know, you give into pressures or you give into concessions or, hey, the next program is gonna bring us more students. So that's more important. But if that program doesn't help you fit mission, it's worthless. So I would say to any leader out there, make sure mission central to what you do. Reiterate your mission statement over and over again at your meetings, have people memorize it, talk about it. If your staff doesn't know your mission statement, you're doing something wrong. So we have weekly devotions and we talk about our mission statement almost every week. So not that makes us better than anybody else, but that's how important it is to us being successful. So we really gauge our success on, are we staying true to mission? Even if that costs us students, are we staying true to mission so that we can do what we were designed to do? Honestly, I think that might be the top three best advice I've got from the podcast so far. That's because it's so true and so good. And I love that you actually said a part that I was going to say after you were done to like reemphasize it, but you said it already. We were saying like, hey, you need to have a mission and you need to be, you know, blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh, it's good. It's good. But then you said, you need to repeat it over and over again at the team meetings. You need to have people memorize it. They need to be bought in on this thing. It's not just like, it's on our wall. Every, they probably read it every it should, day. It should be on your wall. Yeah, it, it should, should be, be on your wall too. But you uh, can't expect everybody to read it every day. So I love that right. you're being uh, proactive and you're yeah. saying, hey, this is probably going to bore you at times, but I'm going to say this every single meeting so that we know we're all part of the same mission together. So I love, that was solid. Super. And good. I cannot, I cannot tell you Mitchell, how many times I've gotten up in front of our staff and I've reiterated the mission. And I think they hate me right now. <laughs> I just keep saying this. And they think, they think I don't have any good advice for them at all, but uh, it is that important. And any leader out there, if you're looking for a good resource on how important mission is, I'd really encourage you to read the book mission drift by Peter Greer. It's phenomenal. He's the president of Hope International, which is a really big entrepreneurial mission organization. It's actually based in Lancaster County, so it's a nice, but it is a global, it's huge. So that's a great book and highly encourage anyone who thinks maybe your organization is drifting from mission. Peter does a nice job succinctly kind of walking you through that process and how you can stay on mission. I love it. And I think what you should do just to mess with them, Nate, the next one, stand up and be like, guys. I think we're, we need to change our mission statement a little bit and just like <laughs> give them a new one just for fun and just see if they go, are you kidding me? No, we're not changing it. And just say, yeah, they, that would probably drive them nuts. <laughs> we went through a mission statement change about four years ago. So this has been so good. I've learned a ton from you and I love what you guys are doing up there in Pennsylvania. So just wanted to say thank you again for taking of the time to be on the podcast and pouring into this next generation and continue to do what you're doing because you guys are doing awesome, Nate. Yeah, I really appreciate the time, Mitchell. Likewise, continue doing what you're doing because we learn well from each other if we're not reaching out to one another and, and trying to get better and kind of gleaning advice from all those around us who are doing the same thing. You know, that's what we're designed to do. We're designed to live in community mm-hmm. and help each other out. And so I love what you're doing. Keep doing it and I'll keep listening. Thanks so much. Well, another huge shout out and a thank you to Nathan for taking time and being on the podcast today. I loved our conversation and I love what he's doing with his school and I'm wishing them nothing but the best as they continue to grow and educate the next generation that's coming behind us. And if you're a school that's listening to this and you need help, you need help growing your enrollment or finding ways to automate things, man, we have the solution for you. It is a school success system. We've built it just for schools to help you guys streamline and automate your application and enrollment process. And I'd love to show it to you and see how it can help your school grow and move into these future years that you guys are quickly, quickly going into. So reach out to us. You can find us online at schoolsuccessmakers.com. That is schoolsuccessmakers.com. Or if you're a Facebook user, I'd love to personally see you in our private Facebook community just for school leaders called School Success Makers. I would love to see you in there. School Success Makers private group on Facebook just for school leaders. All right. You guys, we'll be here next week with another amazing guest as usual on the School Success Podcast. We'll see you then.